In this video, I'm going to explore completion handlers. What are they? How can we create them? And how can we use them? They're a fundamental concept in programming and are often referred to as callbacks. As we proceed, we'll also learn about escaping completion blocks and trailing closures. We'll start with the playground as an introduction to develop the concept and end up with looking at a simple iPhone app to reinforce our learning. I'll leave a link to both starter projects in the notes below. If this is something you want to learn, keep watching. First, consider this function. All it does is wait two seconds, then prints the text. We can call this function and see it is doing what we expect. It waits two seconds and then prints the string to the console. So let's create an issue with this function. First, let's comment this out and look at sample function two. This time we print a second statement after we have asked to print the first one. Let's call the function and we see that the second statement is immediately printed, and then the first one is printed two seconds later. This is a problem with synchronous operations. One step follows another. So while we ask for the first statement, the request went off, but it is going to wait two seconds before printing. Meanwhile, the program moved on and printed the second one before the two seconds was up. This is exactly the kind of thing that is happening when you make an API request. You somehow have to wait until you get the response from your API first before you can move on to dealing with that response. The way we deal with that is using a completion block. So let me comment out our previous call so as not to confuse yourself with the responses coming into our console in the next one. A completion block is simply a block of code that will be executed after the main task is completed. We define a completion block as we do any other argument in our function. We give it a name, and I like using completion, and it can be anything. And the type though is a closure, a block of code. Right now, our closure, which is going to be our print statement, takes in no parameters and returns nothing, so we can use the word void. Sometimes you'll see two brackets instead of the word void. They mean the same thing. I'm going to use void. The actual block of code, the print statement, will be passed in by the calling function. This is really just defining the kind of information that will be passed in, the type of function or closure. As I said, this completion will be run after the main task, which is the first statement, so we simply call our function by the argument name and with no arguments as we defined. We get this error. Escaping closure captures non-escaping parameter completion. Completion blocks are closures and are non-escaping by default. Um, what are escaping closures? An escaping closure is a closure that is called after the function it was passed to returns. In other words, it outlives the function it was passed to. This can be a bit confusing at first, but fortunately for us, Xcode will tell us that the closure will escape and force us to add the at escaping keyword in front of our closure. Let's see how we can call our function and use this closure and perhaps it will make more sense in a minute. When we start to call our function we see that we have two options for writing our call. Let's choose this one that includes our function argument label. This part is a closure. Since no parameters are being passed in, it's basically the function body, so we can replace it with these two parentheses. And within the parentheses, we can execute our code, which is our print statement. You see that this code is being executed after our sample function has basically returned, and it has escaped the function, so that is why we have to mark it as at escaping. If we run this now, we see that the sample function 3 print statement waits 2 seconds, prints, and then immediately prints the following statement in the closure. This is exactly what we want. You'll seldom see the call to this function written this way, however. It's just not swifty. Let's comment the block out and see what I mean. The normal way to do this is to choose the other option we were presented. Whenever you have a trailing closure, 
That's when the completion block is the last parameter or the last argument of a function. So we can eliminate the argument label and all you're left with is the code block. Within the code block, we pass the closure that is expected by the function. And this is our print statement. Running once more, we see we get the identical printout to the console. Next, let's see how we can use arguments or parameters in our completions. But first, let's comment out the previous function call. In this function, I'm going to add an escaping completion block, but instead of having no argument for our closure, I'm going to include a string. This means that after our main task is completed, we can call the completion closure and include a string argument, like this. Let's see how this affects the calling of our function. When we call our function and double click on the closure in the code completion, we see we get our new argument in brackets and a new keyword in. Because closures don't have function names or argument labels, we name our argument inside the brackets and say we're going to use this in our code. So we can then just print out our response within our completion block. Running it confirms the case. Let's comment this out and move on to our last example for this section. Functions can have other arguments besides a closure. For example, consider this function that has a string argument with the argument label search string. Let's add an escaping closure block that itself has a string argument and returns void. As the final task of this function, we'll run our completion block, and that completion block requires a string argument. And this string can include our function argument. So now when we call the function, we have to provide a search string, and then double clicking on the completion code, we get to name our completion argument that will be used in the cold block. The first argument is being passed to the function, which is used by the completion block to manipulate the string that is passed back to the argument. Now we can print it out. Okay, now that we have this information, let's move on to an iPhone app example. In this, our second example, we're going to take a look at a UIKit application. It's a storyboard application, and on the main view controller, we have a table view, a button called Get Data, and a navigation bar button titled Show Modal. When the user taps on the Get Data button, it will call a function that will retrieve data from somewhere and populate the table view based on one of the function arguments. Tapping on the Show Modal button presents the modal view controller that also has a table view and another Get Data button. This button retrieves data from the same source but sends a different argument, getting different results, and populates the table view here. That's pretty straightforward. The view controller has a variable called API data that is an array of API data objects. And we'll look at that in just a second. And this data is used as the data source to populate the table view. The getData button uses the getDataSimulator function to simulate getting data from an API, that takes about two seconds. The fetch data is then assigned to the API data variable, and then the table view is reloaded. The API data struct is quite simple, containing a single property, name, and then a static function that we can use to return a different array of API data based on the item parameter. Let's run this application in the simulator. If we click on the Get Data button and wait two seconds, we'd expect the data in the table to be populated, but it doesn't. If we click once more, the table view immediately reloads, showing the retrieved items in the table view. What's going on? Let's follow the code. When the button is tapped, the Get Simulator button is called, but it has a two second delay. So before it gets the data, the next step, the reloading of the table view is executed, 
but our API data is still an empty array, so nothing is displayed. Meanwhile, the two second wait is over and our get data simulator function continues and retrieves the data and assigns it to return data, which then assigns it to our array. However, it's too late for our table view. It's already been reloaded. When we tap again, it repeats the process, but because our API data array from the first tap had already been assigned to our array, while waiting for the new updates to come back, the table view was reloading showing that old data retrieved from the first tap. This looks like a job for completion handler. Let's add a completion handler to the get data simulator so that it'll retrieve the data and populate the array before reloading our data. The reloading of the data is happening inside the get data button action. So this means that the action of reloading the table view is escaping the function. Let's cut out the get data button action first because we'll change and rewrite our function with a completion handler. The action of reloading data has no parameters and returns none, so our completion handler can be written just like this. Remember, let's use the keyword escaping. Now we can add completion before the end of our function. That means it's going to get the data and then complete our action after the fact. We can rewrite our call to this function and place our table view dot reload data inside our closure. And yes, because we're in a closure, we have to add self before our table view. Let's run the app. And when we tap on our get data button, after two seconds, the data loads. This function is currently not reusable because the UI code is in the function itself. First, let's remove our action in the get data button and go back and modify our get data simulator function. What I want to do is pass back our return data as the argument of our completion function so that I can use it in our button call to the function. This means we can, within our completion block, add our array of API data in the closure argument, and then we can remove the assignment of the API data variable here and pass the return data back as the completion argument. Back in the get data button, as we start to call our function, we can specify our item, and we see that the completion function now expects an array of API data. Double clicking on this trailing closure gives us our argument label placeholder that we see will be an array of API data, so let's just call it API data. And here we assign this to the API data variable for our view controller. With that now received, we can reload our table view. Let's run the app and tap the get data button. After two seconds, we have our table view. I'm gonna take a bit of a tangent here and talk about this line of code. What this is saying is that it's delaying and returning our data on the main thread. This is great, but in reality, if we're fetching our data from an API, it will be coming back on a background thread. So let's just change this to a background thread using global with a background quality of service. When we run the app now and tap get user, the app crashes with the error UI table view reload data must be used from the main thread only. All updates to the UI must be made on the main thread. So to solve this, we can enclose our completion block, which is where the table view gets reloaded, inside a dispatch dispatchq.main.async block. Running the code again, the error goes away. Now we know we want to retrieve our data in our modal view controller as well, and it will be a different array from the one that we get for our main view controller. So we want to extract this function and put it in a service class as a static function. I've created an entire video on static functions, so if this is confusing to you, I'll leave a link in the notes below. I'm gonna cut this out and create a new Swift file, and I'll call it service. Inside here, I'll create a class called service, 
and I'll paste that function into the body of our class. All I need to do is add the keyword static in front of the class, and now I can use it as a method of our service class from anywhere in our application. Returning to the view controller, I can fix the error in our get data button action by adding service dot in front of our function. And while we're at it, let's move on to the modal view controller that has an almost identical setup with the variable for the table view data source, this time called API data two, and an action that requests the data in this button. We can use this service method exactly the same way, but this time ask for item two and assign the return API data to our API data two variable and then reload the table view. Let's test. The first screen still waits two seconds and displays our first set of names. Tapping on our navigation bar button presents the modal screen. And here we can tap on this get data button. And after waiting two seconds, we get our second set. Well, I hope through these two examples, you have a better understanding of how to create and use completion blocks in Swift. You will definitely come across these all the time, and it's important to know how to create and use them. I hope you found this video useful. If so, please give it a thumbs up below and subscribe to my channel. If I get enough positive feedback, I'll continue to build out similar tutorials for Swift developers who have left the starting gate but still need to add to their toolbox. You can check out my YouTube channel to see what other videos I've created. Visit my website to see my iOS app portfolio of apps currently on the App Store. And check out my GitHub repository to see what else I'm up to. Thanks for watching. I'm most active on Twitter. So follow me there for notifications of other Swift-related things that I'm up to.